हिस्ट्री ऑफ मेडिवल इंडिया बाय सतीश चंद्रा चैप्टर टू नदर्न इंडिया एज ऑफ थ्री एम्पायर्स आफ्टर द डिक्लाइन ऑफ हर्षाज एम्पायर इन द सेवेंथ सेंचुरी अ नंबर ऑफ लार्ज स्टेट्स अरोज इन नॉर्थ इंडिया द टेकन इन साउथ इंडिया अनलाइक द गुप्ता एंड हर्षाज एम्पायर इन नॉर्थ इंडिया नन ऑफ द अदर किंगडम्स इन नॉर्थ इंडिया वर एबल टू ब्रिंग द एंटायर गंगा वैली अंडर इट्स कंट्रोल The Ganga Valley with its population and other resources was the basis of which the Gupta rulers and Harsha had been able to extend their control over Gujarat which with its sea rich seaports and manufacturers was important for overseas trade Malwa and Rajasthan were the essential links between the Ganga Valley and Gujarat This defined the geographical limits of an empire in North India In South India the Cholas were able to bring the Krishna Godavari and Kaveri data under its control this was the basis of their supremacy in south india large states arose in north india and the deccan between ad 750 and 1000 these were the pala empire which dominated eastern india till the middle of the 9th century the pratihara empire which dominated western india and the upper gangetic valley till the middle of the 10th century and the rashtrakuta empire which dominated the deccan and also controlled territories in north and south india at various times each of these empires although they fought among themselves provided stable conditions of life over large areas extended agriculture built ponds and canals and gave patronage to arts and letters including temples of the three the rashtrakuta empire lasted the longest it was not only the most powerful empire of the time but also acted as a bridge between north and south india in economic as well as cultural matters the period following the death of harsha was a period of political confusion for some time lalit aditya the ruler of kashmir brought the punjab under its control and even controlled kannauj which since the days of harsha was considered the symbol of sovereignty of north india a position which delhi was to acquire later Control of Kannauj also implied control of the upper Gangetic Valley and its rich resources in trade and agriculture. Lalit Aditya even invaded Bengal or Gaur and killed its reigning king. But his power waned with the rise of the Pala and Gujar Pratiharas. The Palas and the Pratiharas clashed with each other for the control of area extending from Banaras to South Bihar. which again had rich resources and well developed imperial traditions the pratihara also clashed with the rashtrakuta of the deccan the pala empire was founded by gopala probably in ad 750 when he was elected king by the notable men of the area to end the anarchy prevailing there gopala was not born in a high much less a royal family his father probably being a soldier He unified Bengal under its control and even brought Magadh Bihar under its control. Gopala was succeeded in AD 770 by his son Dharampala who ruled till AD 810. His reign was marked by a tripartite struggle between the Palas, the Pratiharas and the Rashtrakutas for the control of Kannauj and North India. The Pratihara ruler advanced upon God Bengal but before a decision could be taken the pratihara ruler was defeated by the rashtrakuta ruler dhruv and was forced to seek refuge in the deserts of rajasthan dhruv then returned to the deccan this left a field free for dharmpala who occupied kannauj and held a great darbar which was attended by vassal ruler punjab eastern india etc we are told that the rule of dharmpala extended upon the furthest limits of india in the northwest and perhaps included malwa and berar apparently this implied that the rulers of these areas accepted the suzerainty of dharmpala the triumphal career of dharmpala may be placed between ad 790 and 800 dharmpala could not however consolidate his power in north india the pratihara power revived the nagabhatta too dharmpala fell back but was defeated near mongir Bihar and modern East Uttar Pradesh remain a bone of contention between the Palas and Pratiharas. 
however, Bihar in addition to Bengal remained under control of Palas for most of the time. Failure in North India compelled the Pala rulers to turn their energies in other directions. Dev Pala, the Sarma of Dharampala, who succeeded the throne in AD 810 and ruled 40 years, extended his control over Prakjyotishpur, Assam and parts of Odisha. Probably a part of modern Nepal was also brought under Pala's suzerainty. Thus, for about a hundred years from the middle of the 8th to the middle of the 9th century, the Pala rulers dominated eastern India. For some time, their control extended upon Varanasi. Their power is attested to by an Arab merchant, Suleiman, who visited India in the middle of 9th century and wrote an account of it. He calls the Pala kingdom Rahuma or Dharma short for Dharampala and says that Pala ruler was at war with his neighbors. The Pratiharas and the Rashtrakutas, where his troops were more numerous than his adversaries. He tells us that it was customary for the Pala king to be accompanied by a force of 50,000 elephants and that 10,000 to 15,000 men in his army were employed in fulling and washing clothes. Even if these figures may be exaggerated, we can assume that the Pala had a large military force at their disposal. But we do not know whether they had a large standing army or whether their forces consisted largely of feudal levies. Information about the Pala is also provided to us by Tibetan chronicles, although these were written in the 17th century. According to these, the Pala rulers were great patrons of Buddhist learning and religion. The Nalanda University, which had been famous all over the eastern world, was revived by Dharampala and 200 villages were set apart for meeting its exp expenses. He also founded the Vikramshila University, which became second only to Nalanda in frame. It was located on the top of the hill on the banks of Ganga in Magad, amidst pleasant surroundings. The Pala built many viharas in which large number of Buddhist monks lived. The Pala rulers also had close cultural relations with Tibet. The noted Buddhist scholars Santarakshita and the Pankara called Atisa were invited to Tibet and they introduced a new form of Buddhism there. As a result, many Tibetan Buddhists flocked to the universities of Nalanda and Vikramshila for studies. Although the Palas were supporters of Buddhism, they also extended their patronage to Saivism and Vaishnavism. They gave grants to large number of Brahmans from North India who flocked to Bengal. Their settlements helped in the extension of cultivation in the area and the transformation of many pastoralists and food gatherers to settle down to cultivation. The growing prosperity of Bengal helped in the extending trade and cultural contacts with countries of Southeast Asia, Burma, Malaya, Java, Sumatra, etc. The trade with Southeast Asia was very profitable and added greatly to the prosperity of Pala Empire and led to the incursion of gold and silver from these countries into Bengal. The powerful Sailendra dynasty, which was Buddhist in faith and ruled over Malaya, Java, Sumatra and the neighboring islands, sent many embassies to the Pala court and sought permission to build a monastery at Nalanda and also requested the Pala ruler Deva Pala to endow five villages for its upkeep. The request was granted and bears testimony to the close relation between the two empires. The Pratiharas the Pratiharas, who ruled over Kannauj for a long time, are also called Gujar Pratiharas. Most scholars consider that they originated from the Gujar who were pastoralists and fighters like the Jats. The Pratiharas established a series of principalities in central and eastern Rajasthan. They clashed with the Rashtrakutas for the control of Malwa and Gujarat and later for Kannauj, which implied control of the upper Ganga Valley. The Pratiharas, who first had their capital at Bhinmal, gained prominence under Nagabhatta I, who offered strout resistance to the Arab ruler of Sindh, who were gaining to encroach on Rajasthan, Gujarat, the Punjab, etc. The Arabs made a big thrust toward Gujarat, but were decisively defeated by the Chalukyan ruler of Gujarat in 738. 
Although small Arab incursions continued, the Arabs ceased to be a threat thereafter. The efforts of the early Pratihara ruler to extend their control over Upper Ganga Valley and Malwa were defeated by the Rashtrakuta ruler Dhruv and Gopala III. In 790 and again in 806-07, the Rashtrakutas defeated the Pratiharas and then withdrew to the Deccan, leaving the field free for Palas. Perhaps the main interest of the Rashtrakuta was the domination of Malwa and Gujarat. The real founder of the Pratihara Empire and the greatest ruler of the dynasty was Bhoj. We do not know much about the early life of Bhoj or when he ascended the throne. He rebuilt the empire and by about AD 836, he had recovered Kannauj, which remained the capital of the Pratihara Empire for almost a century. Bhoj tried to extend his sway in the east, but he was defeated and checkmated by the Pala ruler Devapala. He then turned towards central India and the Deccan and Gujarat. This led to the revival of the struggle of Rashtrakutas. In a sanguinary battle on the Battle of Narmada, Bhoja was able to retain his control over considerable parts of Malwa and some parts of Gujarat. But he could progress no further in the Deccan. Hence, he turned his attention to the north again. According to an inspiration, his territories extended to the western side of the river Satluj. Arab travelers tell us that the Pratihara ruler had best cavalry in India. Import of horses from Central Asia and Arabia was an important item of India's trade at that time. Following the death of Devapala and weakening of the Pala Empire, Boja also extended his empire in the east. The name of Boja is famous in legends. Perhaps the adventures of Boja in early parts of his life his gradual reconquest of lost empire and his final recovery of Kannad struck the imagination of his contemporaries. Bhuja was a devotee of Vishnu and adopted the title of Adi Varaha, which had been found inscribed in some of his coins. He is sometimes called the Mihir Bhuj to distinguish him from the Bhuj Paramara of Ujjain who ruled a little later. Bhuja probably died in 885. He was succeeded by his son Mahindrapala I. Mahindrapala, who ruled till about 908 to 909, maintained the empire of Bhoja and extended it over Magadh and North Bengal. His inscriptions have been found in the Katya Ward, East Punjab and Awadh. Mahindrapala fought a battle with the king of Kashmir but had to yield him some of his territories in the Punjab won by Bhoja. The Pratihara rulers thus dominated North India for over 100 years, from the early 9th to the middle of the 10th century. Al Masudi, a native of Baghdad who inspired Gujarat in 915 to 916, testifies to the great power and prestige of Pratihara rulers and the vastness of their empire. He calls the Guja Pratihara kingdom Al Jizr, a corrupt form of Gujarat and the King Bora, probably a mispronunciation of Adi Varaha, the title used by Boja, although Boja had died by that time. Al Masudi says that the empire of Jizr had 1,80,000 villages, cities and rural areas and was about 2,000 km in length and 2,000 km in breadth. The king's army had four divisions, each consisting of 7 lakh to 9 lakh men. With the army of the north, he fight against the ruler of Multan and other Muslims who align themselves with him. The army of the south fought against the Rashtrakutas and that of the east against the Palas. He had only 2000 elephants trained for war, but the best cavalry of any king in the country. The Pratiharas were patrons of learning and literature. The great Sanskrit poet and dramatist Raj Shekhar lived at the court of the Mahipala, a grandson of Bhoja. The Pratihara also embellished Kannauj with many fine buildings and temples. During the 8th and 9th century, many Indian scholars went with embassies to the court of the Caliph at Baghdad. These scholars introduced Indian sciences, especially mathematics, algebra and medicines to the Arab world. We do not know the names of the Indian kings who sent these embassies. 
the Pratiharas were also well known for their hostility to the Arab rulers of Sindh. Despite this, it seems that the movement of scholars and goods between India and the West continued even during this period. Between 915 and 918, the Rashtrakuta king Indra III again attacked Kannauj and devastated the city. This weakened the Pratihara Empire and Gujarat probably passed into the hands of the Rashtrakutas. For Al Masudi tells us that the Pratihara Empire had no access to the sea. The loss of Gujarat, which was the hub of the overseas trade and main outlet for North Indian goods to West Asian countries, was another blow to the Pratiharas. Another Rashtrakuta ruler, Krishna III, invaded North India in about 963 and defeated the Pratihara ruler. This was followed by the rapid dissolution of Pratihara Empire. While the Palas and the Pratiharas were ruling over North India, the Tekken was being ruled by Rashtrakutas, a remarkable dynasty which produced a long line of warriors and able administrators. The kingdom was founded by Danti Durga, who set up his capital at Manyakhet or Malkhed near modern Sholapur. The Rashtrakutas soon dominated the entire area of Maharashtra. They also engaged with the Pratiharas for the overlordship of Gujarat and Malwa as we have seen above. Although their raids did not result in the extension of the Rashtrakuta Empire to the Ganga Valley, they bought rich plunder and added to the fame of Rashtrakuta. The Rashtrakutas also fought constantly against the eastern Chalukyas of Vengi in modern Andhra Pradesh and in the south against the Pallavas of Kanchi and the Pandyas of Madurai. Probably the greatest Rashtrakuta ruler were Govind the Third, 793-814 and Amoga Varsha, 814-878. After a successful expedition against Nagabatta of Kannauj and the annexation of Malwa, Govind the Third returned to the south. We are told in an inscription that Govinda terrified the Kerala, Pandya and the Chola kings and caused the Pallavas to wither. The Ganga of Karnataka, who became dissatisfied through baseness, were bound down with fetters and met with death. The king of Lanka and his minister, who had been negligent of their own interest, were captured and brought over as prisoners to Halapur. Two statues of Lord of Lanka were carried to the Manyakhet and installed like pillars of victory in front of Siva temple. Amok Varsha ruled for 64 years, but by temperament he preferred the pursuit of religion and literature to war. He was himself an author and is credited with writing the first Kannad book on poetics. He was a great builder and is said to have built the capital city Manyakhet so as to excel the city of Indra. There were many rebellions in the far-flung Rashtrakuta Empire under Amogavarsha. These could be barely contained and begin afresh after his death. His grandson Indra III, 915-927, re-established the empire. After the defeat of Mahipala and the sack of Kannauj in 915, Indra III was the most powerful ruler of his times. According to Al Masudi, who visited India at the time, the Rashtrakuta king Balhara or Vallabhraja was the greatest king of India and most of Indian rulers accepted the suzerainty and respected his envoys. He possessed large armies and the innumerable elephants. Krishna III, 934-963, was the last in a line of brilliant rulers. He was engaged in a struggle against the Paramaras of Malwa and the eastern Chalukyas of Vengi. He also launched a campaign against the Chola ruler of Tanjore, who had supplanted the Pallavas of Kanji. Krishna III defeated the Chola king Paranataka 1 AD 949 and annexed the northern part of the Chola empire. He then pressed down the Rameshwaram and set up a pillar of victory there and built a temple. 
After his death, all his opponents united against his successor. The Rashtrakuta capital, Malakhed, was sacked and burned in 972. This marked the end of the Rashtrakuta Empire. The Rashtrakuta rule in the Deccan thus lasted for almost 200 years till the end of the 10th century. The Rashtrakuta rulers were tolerant in religious views and patronized not only Saivism and Vaishnavism but Jainism as well. The famous rocket temple of Shiva at Ellora was built by one of the Rashtrakuta king Krishna I in the 9th century. His successor Amogavarsha is said to have been a Jain but be also patronized other faith. The Rashtrakutas allowed Muslim trades to settle and permitted Islam to be preached in their dominions. We are told that the Muslim had their own headmen and large mosques for their daily prayers in many of the coastal towns in the Rashtrakuta Empire. This tolerant policy helped to promote foreign trade which enriched the Rashtrakutas. The Rashtrakuta kings were great patrons of arts and letters. In their courts, we find not only Sanskrit scholars but also poets and others who wrote in Prakrit and in the Aparamma Bhasha. The so-called Karab language which were the forerunners of the various modern Indian languages. The great Apabrahmasha poet Swayambhu and his son probably lived at the Rashtrakuta court. Political Ideas and Organization The system of administration in this empire was based on the ideas and practices of Gupta Empire. The Harsha Kingdom in the north and Chalukyas in the Deccan. As before, the monarch was the center of all affairs. He was the head of the administration as well as commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He sat in a magnificent darbar. Squadrons of infantry and cavalry were stationed in his courtyard. Captured war elephants and horses were paraded before him. He was attended by the royal chamberlains who regulated the coming and going of vessel chiefs, fiduciaries, ambassadors and other high officials who regularly waited on the king. The king also dispensed justice. The court was not only a center of political affairs and justice but cultural life as well. Dancing girls and skilled musicians attended the court. Women of the king's household also attended the darbar on festive occasions. In the Rashtrakuta Empire, according to the Arab writers, women did not veil their faces. The king's position was generally hereditary. Thinkers of the time emphasized absolute loyalty and obedience to the king because of the insecurity of the times. Wars was frequent between kings and between kings and their vessels. While kings strove to maintain law and order within their kingdoms, their arms rarely extended far enough. Vassal rulers and autonomous chiefs often limited the areas of the direct administration of the king. Although the king adopted the high-sounding titles such as Maharaja Dhiraj Param Bhattaraka, etc. and claimed to be Chakravarti or supreme of all Indian rulers, a contemporary writer Medhantiti thinks that it was the right of an individual to bear arms in order to defend himself against thieves and assassins. He also thinks that it was right to oppose an unjust king. Thus, the extreme view of royal rights and privileges put forward mainly in the Puranas was not accepted by all the thinkers. The rulers about succession were not rigidly fixed. The eldest son often succeeded, but there are many instances when the eldest son had to fight his younger brothers and sometimes lost to them. Thus, the Rashtrakuta rulers Dhruva and Govinda IV disposed their elder brothers. Sometimes, ruler designated the eldest brother or another favorite son as their Yuvraja or successor. In that case, the Yuvraj stayed at the capital and helped in the task of administration. Younger sons were sometimes appointed provincial governors. Princes were rarely appointed to government posts but we do have an instant when a Rashtrakuta princess Chandra Balabe, a doctor, daughter of Amogavarsha I, administered the Raichur Doab for some time. Kings were generally advised by a number of ministers. The ministers were chosen by the king, generally from leading families. 
their position was often hereditary. Thus, in the case of the Pala kings, we hear a Brahmana family supplied four successive chief ministers to the Rampala and his successors. In such cases, the minister could become very powerful. Although we hear a number of departments of the central government, we do not know how many of them were there and how they worked. From the epigraphic and literary records, it appears that in almost every kingdom there was a minister of correspondence which included foreign affairs, a revenue minister, treasurer, chief of the arms forces, senapati, chief justice and purohita. More than one post could be combined in one person and perhaps one of the ministers were considered the chief or the leading minister on whom the king learned more than the others. All the ministers except the Purohita were accepted to lead military campaigns as well as called upon to do so. We also hear of officials of the royal household Antapur since the king was the fountain head of all the power some of the officers of household became very powerful. The armed forces were very important for the maintenance of the expansion of empire. We already have cited evidence from the Arab travelers that the Pala, Pratihara and Rashtrakuta kings had large and well-organized infantry and cavalry and large number of war elephants. Elephants were supposed to be elements of strength and were greatly prized. The largest number of elephants were maintained by the Pala king. Large number of horses were imported both by the Rashtrakuta and Pratihara king by the Sea of Arabia and West Asia and overland from the Khurasan, East Persia and Central Asia. The Pratihara kings are believed to have had the finest cavalry in the country. There are no reference to war chariots which had fallen out of use. Some of the kings, especially the Rashtrakutas, had a large number of forts. They were garrisoned by special troops and had their own independent commanders. The infantry consisted of regular and irregular troops and of levies provided by the vassal chiefs. The regular troops were often hereditary and sometimes drawn from the different regions all over India. Thus, the Pala infantry consisted of soldiers from Malwa, Khasa, Assam, Lata, South Gujarat, and Karnataka. The Pala kings and perhaps the Rashtrakutas had their own navies but we do not know much about their strength and organization. The empire consisted of the area administrator directly areas ruled over by the vassal chiefs. The latter were autonomous as far as their internal affairs were concerned and had a general obligation of loyalty, paying a fixed tribute and supplying the quota of troops to the overlord. Sometimes, a son of a vassal chief was required to stay in the attendance of the overlord to guard against rebellion. The vassal chiefs were required to attend the darbar of the overlord on special occasions and sometimes they were required to marry one of their daughter to the overlord or to one of his sons. But the vassal chiefs always aspired to be independent and wars between them and the overlord were frequent. Thus, the Rashtrakutas had to fight constantly against the vassal chiefs of Vangi, Andhra, and Karnataka. The Pratiharas had to fight against the Paramaras of Malwa and the Chandelas of Bundelkhand. The directly administered territories in the Pala and Pratihara empires were divided into Bhukti provinces and Mandalas or Visaya district. The governor of a province was called Uparika and head of a district Vishyapati. The Uparika was expected to collect land revenue and maintain law and order with the help of army. The Vishyapati was expected to do the same within his jurisdiction. During the period, there was an increase of smaller chieftains called Samantas or Bhogapatis who dominated over a number of villages. The Vishyapatis and the smaller chiefs tended to merge with each other and later on the word Samantas began to be used indiscriminately for both of them. In the Rashtrakuta kingdom, the directly administered areas were divided into Rashtra provinces, Visya and Bhukti. The head of Rashtra was called Rashtrapati and he performed the same functions as the Uparika did in the Pala and Pratihara empires. 
the visaya was like a modern district and the bukti was a smaller unit to it in the pala and pratihara empires the unit below the visaya was called patala the precise role of the smaller units is not known it seems that their main purpose was the realization of land revenue and some attention to law and order apparently all of the officials were paid by giving them grants of free land this tended to blur the distinction between local officials and the hereditary chiefs and smaller vassals similarly the rashtrapati or governor sometimes enjoyed the status and title of a vassal king below these territorial divisions was the village the village was the basic unit of administration the village administration was carried on by the village headman and the village accountant whose posts were generally hereditary these were paid by grants of rent free lands the headman was often helped in his duty by the village elders called grama mahajan or grama mahatra in the rashtrakuta kingdom particularly in karnataka we are told that there were villages committees to maintain local schools tanks temples and roads they could also receive money or property interest and manage them these sub committees worked in close cooperation with the headman and received a percentage of the revenue collection simple disputes were also decided by these committees towns had similar committees to which the heads of trade guilds were also associated law and order in the town and in the area in the immediate vicinity was the responsibility of kosh the pala or kotwal a figure made familiar through many stories an important feature of the period was the rise in the deccan of hereditary revenue officers called nad gaundas or desak gramakutas they appear to have discharged the same function as the deshmukhs and deshpandes of later times in maharashtra this development along with the petri chief chieftainships in the north india which we have just mentioned had an important bearing on societies and politics as the power of these hereditary elements grew the village committees became weaker the central rulers also found it difficult to assert his authority over them and to control them this is what we mean when we say that the government was becoming feudalized another point to bear in mind is the relationship of state and religion during the time many of the rulers of the time were devout followers of shiva or vishnu or they followed the teaching of buddhism or jainism they made handsome donations to the brahmans or the buddhist viharas or the jain temples but generally they gave patronage to all the faith and did not persecute anyone for his or her religious beliefs muslims were also welcomed and allowed to preach their faith by the rashtrakuta king normally a king was not expected to interfere with the customs or with the code of conduct prescribed by the law books called the dharma shastras but he did have the general duty of protecting brahmans and maintaining the division of society into four states or varnas the purohita was expected to guide the king in this matter but it should not be thought that the purohita interfered with state affairs or dominated the king medatithi the foremost expounder of dharma shastra in this period says that the king authority was derived both from the dharma shastra including the vedas and from the ardha shastra or the science of polity his public duty of raj dharma was to be based on the ardha shastra that is on the principle of politics this really meant that politics and religion were in essence kept apart religion being essentially a personal duty of the king thus the kings were not dominated by the priests or by sacred law expounding by them religion was however important for legitimizing and strengthening the position of the rulers many of the rulers therefore built grand temples often at their capitals and gave handsome land grants for maintaining of the temples and to the brahmans